Welcome once again to Flawed Masterpieces. We're looking at the experience of the unsung heroes of the Bible, people that we don't usually take notice of in our sermons or our Bible studies, things like that. And today we have a particularly fascinating character, uh, a woman of the Old Testament, and I get to have the woman of my house here with me as well. So Timberly uh, is joining us as well. I wanna let you know also, and we'll say this at the end as well. Next week will be the last Flawed Masterpieces. We'll start a new series, and we'll tell you more about that uh, later on. But uh, the series Flawed Masterpieces is going to become our sermon series for the summer. So you'll still be getting more of these experiences and uh, and hope that's a good thing. I think there's enough Flawed Masterpieces in the Bible <laughs> I think to there's a lot of them. A lot of unsung heroes, no yeah. question. So today I'd like you to turn uh, with us right now to beginning with Exodus 15, beginning with the 20th verse. Uh, we're looking at the life, uh, well, it is wrapped around the life of Moses and the people of Israel as they are, um, as they have just been saved from the Red Sea and uh, Pharaoh's army has been destroyed, uh, the Red Sea has parted. Uh, the Israelites have uh, walked safely to the other side. This is really, in the Old Testament, the key moment of God's great salvation. And just as the cross is the key moment of God's salvation in the New Testament, so the Red Sea is that key moment in the Old Testament. And in Exodus 15, verse 20, I'll begin with verse 19, and we'll read this passage. When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them. But the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam, the prophet, Aaron's sister, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women followed her, and with timbrels and dancing, Miriam sang to them. Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. This is the first mention of Miriam's name. And so we're going to talk for a little bit about this one verse, because it's really quite okay. something. Miriam the prophet, or if you have an older translation, it sometimes is translated the prophetess. And we can talk about that as there well. You have it as prophetess? Yeah. Tell us about you this. You know I have an older older scripture, um, older translation. Well, the word is the same word that's used to talk about male or female prophets. They just feminized it, the translators. But it's exactly the same word. She was a prophet. Well, it actually has a feminine name on the end of the word for prophet. Mm -hmm. So um, it is it is the word Navi um, and, uh, and, and then the a H at the end yeah, yeah. is female. So it could be translated prophetess, but the problem with that translation is you get the idea that it's somehow different from a prophet. It's like the deacon deaconess discussion we had. That was a couple of weeks couple ago, of weeks exactly. Ago. It's the same thing. Miriam is the first woman to have this title though, yes, but she's she not the only one. Oh no, she's not. I mean we have Holder, we have was Peter's sisters were prophetesses? Um, and uh, yeah, Isaiah's wife. Isaiah's wife was a prophetess. Um, Hannah, Hannah is described in, in other literature that way. And then also we have the Judge Deborah. Uh, um, the Judge Deborah. We also have Anna in the mm -hmm. New Testament mm -hmm. in Luke chapter 2. And in Acts 21, we have an interesting situation of Philip's daughters. Oh, yes, the daughters. Yes. That's right. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah, Philip's so, daughters. But the, what is the job of a prophet? And I've said this in the past, and oh, you and I disagree, you, so you get to take it right it. now. <laughs> I don't know that I'm going to disagree with you so substantially, but the job of the prophet is to speak forth words that God gives to the prophet or to communicate a dream or a vision that God gives to the prophet to the people on behalf of God. Absolutely. Uh, I wrote it down from uh, an author named uh, Doug Stewart who says, the prophet's job is, a, is to faithfully express God's verbal will to the people, either some or all. 
that was probably a little more articulate than what I just about. <laughs> Which is why I had to quote it, because I don't have those words myself. So she had quite a job, I mean, this Miriam. And, and she and is she, also therefore yeah. spoken of as a leader right. of uh, the people of Israel. And let's talk about that for a moment. Well, not in this particular text. It's just Miriam the prophetess in Aaron's sister, and it describes the song. Well, and a prophet is a leader. I, right. would, I would say oh, that to begin with. Absolutely, yes. And so, yes, she is described as a leader in this passage. But then also, I invite you to turn to Micah mm -hmm. chapter mm -hmm. 6. Um, this is a poetic section of the Bible. I love the prophet Micah. It's beautiful poetry in quite often places. This is God speaking to the people of Israel as they are disobedient. And he says to them, my people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I, that is God, brought you up out of Egypt and I redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you and also Aaron and Miriam. So again, the sense is that there's leadership really in some ways. Yes, Moses is the primary leader of the people of Israel. And we see that just in the, the, the sheer vastness of the number mm -hmm. of times he is mentioned. Right. But at the same time, Aaron, who is a priest, and also uh, Miriam, who is here described it's as a prophet, prophet in right. Exodus 15. Mm. What a family. What a family, yes. And... Uh, and so we have one other passage in the book of Numbers that yes. mentions Miriam's name. And that's the main scripture that we're describing today. Oh. But it is a confusing one. It's and like, Kimberly oh. and I, you're going you're gonna to see us have what we in our marriage like to call a time of deep fellowship. Ah. In other words, an argument <laughs> about this sort of thing. Wow. Numbers chapter 12, because we're going to disagree about this. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to kind of... Um, I'm not going to invite that, but I think that's probably the case based well, it's, on what I've heard you say. Well, it's one of those texts that can be interpreted in a variety of ways, legitimately. And we have problems with that with Scripture. We want to know absolutely it says this, it says right. that. And the fact is there are certain sections of Scripture that could be yeah. interpreted in more mm -hmm. than one way. Yeah. And we are hope that we will reflect our absolute respect and trust in God's word is infallible, but are also under, our understanding that we don't understand everything about the culture of the day when the scripture was written, nor the language that was used. Yeah. This is a story about, uh, if you fast forward from the experience of the people of Israel uh, being taken out of Egypt through the waters of the Red Sea, they are now wandering the desert. This is part of the 40 years in the desert. This and is before the law, though, and, the, and, the, and that point. That's a good point. Right. Okay. It's actually before the 40 years. So, wandering. yes. Well, it's at the very part, beginning. part of that. It's at the very beginning, and it's in the first six months. Yes. We okay. agree. We agree. <laughs> and why don't you read 12, 1 through um, uh, <clears throat> 2 or 3. Okay. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he'd married a Cushite. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked? And hasn't he also sp spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Really quite a fascinating passage. And what does it all mean? Well, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses. We'll start with just that portion of the sentence. Mm -hmm. And I think both of us would agree that that's the primary issue here, is that they are questioning Moses' leadership yes, uh, in this place. And uh, I love that passage, and the Lord heard this. Bah, bah, bah. You know, yeah. there's this, this moment of, uh-oh, this is a serious, serious issue. So... Um, then, essentially, um, we need to decide what it means because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Right. What does that mean? Do you have a thought on that? 
Well, my understanding. This is where we disagree. Uh, my understanding <laughs> is there's two uh, opinions of what that means. One is that we're talking about Zephora, who we've already heard of, who he married down in Midian because there were a few areas of Midian that had been called Cush yes. or Cushite areas. So it could be they're talking against Miriam, for I mean, for, against Zephora, for he had married a Cushite. It also could mean he had a second marriage and he married a woman of African descent because Cush was the name that was used to refer to people of Africa who were very dark in skin. And, and if you'd like to find those passages, the Bible actually refers to those passages where Cush describes an area of Africa. That's Genesis 10.6 mm -hmm. and 1 Chronicles 1.8. Right. At the same time, there's a passage in Habakkuk 3.7, we're throwing everything at you folks, that Cush uh, and Midian seem to be described as the same place. Again, I disagree that that's what that, that is doing. I think it's describing distant places, yeah. but not the same place. No, I agree with you there, Brian. I think this is a different woman from Zephora, okay. who we read earlier that Moses sent back with her father, mm -hmm. um, Jethro. Uh, sent back can also be used to say he divorced her. That's another translation. Yeah. So he seems to have remarried, and he remarried a, uh, a woman from Africa. And Mo Miriam and Aaron are not happy. This is either what has angered them or this is a pretext for their anger. And that's, that's a big difference. Let's describe the rest of the passage. Uh, beginning with verse 4, it says, um, The Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. In other words, let's have a meeting. Ah. The Lord is bringing them essentially to the place of the... Um, Ark of the, the Covenant, Holy if you will, Holy the Holy of Holies. And the Lord then speaks and says, my servant Moses, you know, with him I speak face to face. You better believe him. And look at verse 9. The anger of the Lord burned against them, and he left them. When the cloud lifted from above the tent, that is the tent of meeting, where the three of them are, Miriam's skin was leprous. It became as white as snow. And Aaron turned toward her and is terrified and says, Oh, we've sinned, we've sinned, and, and, and Moses, would you please pray for healing? And so, how do you interpret that? Well, and then I'll tell you why you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> well, when I'm confused with a scripture, after I pray, I start with looking about looking at what comes before and what comes after the scripture, because often that helps me to understand it better. And as I looked at what came before, this was in uh, chapter 11, verse 16. The Lord said to Moses, bring 70 of Israel's elders, have them meet with me in the tent of meeting. And then temporarily they were given a gift of prophecy. So this prophecy was expanded by a group of three to group of 73, even though it was temporary. And then after this story, immediately, is chapter 13 is when the Lord says to Moses, send out a, a committee to explore the promised land and come back and give you a report. And when they came back and gave a report, 10 of the 12 people that went out said, we can't inhabit Canaan, the people are too strong fearful, for yeah. us. And two of them, Caleb and Joshua said, oh no, God, can, God called us to this, we can do this. Therefore, what I see this, I see this passage, which is right in the middle of these two stories, as dealing with some similar issues. Who's in, who's out, in terms of the promised people, and who constitutes the people of God. Mm -hmm. God chooses who he will call to ministry in different ways, and God chooses the plan for that ministry. And by arguing with God about those things, which is what I think Moses, um, Moses received arguments from his brother and sister, by questioning the decisions, the authority he had, they were also questioning God's leading and God's calling. And so it's your sense is that this is a description of the... the that, that Miriam and Aaron are questioning Moses' leadership. And, and what I would say is I think there's 
I'm not positive, of course, we're, we're, we're kind of interpreting, we're guessing yes, some of are. this. But my sense also is that there is a racial undertone to this. And let me describe that for a moment. Um, obviously, a, a woman from Kush, that is Africa, would have a different skin color uh, than the rest of these folks, certainly of Moses and Aaron and Miriam, uh, who are all related to one another and from uh, the, the Holy Land, if you will. And uh, therefore, it says here that they are questioning Moses' leadership in choosing this woman because of his Cushite wife. That's the part that really baffles me. Until I look at this, when God then speaks to Moses and Aaron and Miriam. And when God leaves them, Miriam is leprous, and it actually says, as white as snow. Her skin has changed color to from the olive complexion of her youth and her upbringing to a pure white, essentially anything but a black colored skin, no dark skin whatsoever. And in so doing, God has shown his judgment. Aaron is terrified because leprosy was such a dangerous and, and misunderstood and difficult and feared uh, disease that he's terrified that she's basically a walking dead person. She can't be a part of the community for a variety of reasons we won't go into as well. And therefore, it's as if God is saying, you know what, if you don't like the color of the skin that Moses of the woman Moses chose for his wife, let me give you the exact opposite color. See, I disagree with and that. And so I think, I think that is possibly the lesson that Moses has. It's possible, but very slightly possible. Um, the reason I say this is because- This is how we argue over dinner all the time. There's no evidence in scripture that there was any prejudice against a person because of the color of their skin at this point. This was not an issue. I think yep. we're transferring our modern and recent past sensibilities of racism onto this by interpreting that, oh, that was the objection. She was black. Um, we really can't, we really can't come forward with that. And by saying that because Miriam was turned white as snow with leprosy, we're also saying it was a skin color or appearance issue. But the fact is, in every case in scripture where a person contracts leprosy, it is seen as a punishment for sin and a reason to cast them out of community. Yeah. Again, the central issue here is who's in and who's out in the community of God. And so Miriam yeah. gets a lesson in that. God will constitute God's community, and God will also thrust out those that God has even called to positions of honor if they are disobedient. So you have two choices. And, uh, and, and really, in the end, they are describing the same thing. Uh, a challenge to Moses' leadership yes. from his very own family. That never happens. And, <laughs> and so that, that situation, that uncertainty about their leadership, that fearfulness about Moses' leadership and about where things are going, and like you said, who's in, who's out, uh, all those things become something that God judges. What happens at the end of the story then is simply that Miriam is made to, as, as the book of Leviticus describes, uh, she's made to be outside the camp for seven days, mm -hmm. and uh, assumedly she is healed of the leprosy because she's back she in the camp back afterwards. Into the community. She right. comes back into the community. So that's this fascinating story that you helps us understand the whole story. we haven't you didn't so tell the beginning and you didn't tell the end that's true sweetie oh okay <laughs> so this is yes this is a bible study in the eckelman way of communicating too but no we have uh the situation also of uh, therefore what's the beginning of miriam's activity here and I want you to go back all the way back to Exodus chapter 2. And there's a fascinating passage. When Moses is still a baby, 
in the basket that is placed in the River Nile. It's called an ark or a box, but it's, it's made of reeds and pitch and things like that. And Exodus 2.24, it says, during that law, um, Exodus 2.24, yeah. um, no, no, I have the wrong passage. I got the wrong passage. Exodus 2, verse uh, 3. Mary's when when Three the mother okay yeah. I, yeah, okay thank you um, but when the mother of Moses could no, hide him no longer she got a papyrus basket for him coated it with tar and pitch she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile his sister that is Moses' sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to it then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe. Her attendants were walking on the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds, sent her female slave to get it. She opened it, saw the baby, baby, and he was crying. She felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister, that is the same sister who was watching from a distance, asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? And she went and got the baby's mother. Yeah. That's a pretty sharp little girl who's this baby's sister. And the issue that we can probably guess is that Miriam is that sister. We can't be certain. Why yeah. isn't her name listed there? And I think that gets actually into this sense of... Uh, how to introduce someone into a story. You usually don't name someone like that aside from their family connection. And here, for the sake of the story, they don't list it. Later on in Exodus 15, we hear about Miriam the prophetess, who is also Aaron's sister. Right. And so we know that Miriam is related to the brother of Moses and therefore is the sister of Moses. Is she the sister listed here? My sense is she is. Yeah, I think she is, Brian. I agree with you. And most of uh, early Jewish tradition and Christian tradition identifies this woman as Miriam, yeah. this little girl. And in case you're wondering, by the way, yes, the movie The Ten Commandments also has this well, that person is true. as Miriam. There we go. She is not only, therefore, uh, a courageous person from her youth, she is also smart enough to bring Moses to his very mother to kind of lead that yeah. situation. So Moses' mother ends up being the, his nursemaid in Pharaoh's household, which is really quite something. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. The woman thought she gave up her child to the death by crocodile and ended up <laughs> being able to nurse him in the palace of the king. And that's something else. And again, that shows that a great... Um, wisdom of this older the big sister yes uh, so we know that and and that's amazing because in this story clearly aaron's the big brother he's listed first that's convention and then l later on when we get the listing and then miriam is the big sister so it's the little brother that ends up being the hero does that encourage you it encourages me brother? it also lets me know why they might be a little upset yeah. that moses has so much pull with yeah, God, if yeah, you will. Yeah. So I, I'm the one that rescued you. <laughs> I'm your big sister. Exactly. That experience. We hope this is a help to you because once again, just a very few verses about someone can really describe a great deal. You still skip the end. And well, I'm just going to simply say you and I can have an incredible impact. Give us the end, please. Oh, I was hoping you'd ask me. In Numbers chapter 20, and this is after the 40 years, the people are led back to the same spot where Miriam essentially questioned Moses' authority. Mm -hmm. They're at the same spot. 40 years later, in the first month, the whole of Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin and stayed at Kadesh, and there Miriam died and was buried. Quite significant because we have both Miriam, Moses, and Aaron passing, um, not in that order, it's Miriam, Aaron, and Moses passing within a few months, right before they go into the promised land. And Miriam is the first one to go. She dies, and they mention her burial. Now, tradition has several burial sites that people visit to mm -hmm. say this is where Miriam's buried. We don't know for sure. 
That's the end. That's the end. And and you can certainly take notice that this is one of the few occasions where a female's burial is mentioned. Yeah, it's it's, quite a, it's a point of great honor. So once again, someone who was a young girl made a big difference, saved the very person that was going to uh, become the leader of God's people yeah. as he took them out. And then she does something we're not exactly sure why that that causes her to be judged as being sinful in that moment the lord wants everyone to know that her leadership uh should be kind of not questioned but it but at least we should know that she has gone against god's will in that moment to be done and then she returns and returns to honor for the rest of her life. It is once again a description of how great skill, great ability, and even sometimes great sinfulness can be used by God and yeah. lead to a life worth honoring at its end. So we That's hope that gives each one of us encouragement yeah. for the days ahead. want to tell you once again that we are going to uh, next week, uh, we get one more uh, occasion for a teaching. And uh, in that week, uh, I'm going to be preaching next week, so I look forward to that. Uh, and, and then also, we just have some, some wonderful opportunities. I'm actually missing a week. Okay. I think you are. I am. I'm missing a week. I'm preaching in two weeks. Sorry about that, folks. Ignore that man behind the curtain. <laughs> but we're going to tell you next week about a really wonderful opportunity uh, for uh, the, the next study we're going to have. We'll tell you about it then. God bless you. Have a great week.